So um, I'm sure we went through the course outline. We are way behind. I'm hoping that we today I'll cover the outstanding for day two and day three, finish it up so that when we come next week, which is day four, we will do exactly what's on the day four outline, which is now the going into the security side of identity and access management. Okay. Um, for those who don't really know who I am, um, or if you're just joining us on this day three, um, my name is Joya Medom, and um, I have over 11 years doing information technology. I have done implementation, administration, I have done solution and design um, across different organizations, financial, oil and gas. Um, and currently I'm a consultant, security consultant um, here in Ireland with a Microsoft um, top, one of the top Microsoft partners here in Ireland. So I am exposed to different types of organization, infrastructure, solution and security um, services across. Uh, my drive is to see as much professionals we can bring into the security space. I believe that there's a lot to be done as as technology becomes a core enabler to driving business, it has also become very important that we have people who understand how we can secure these organizations. So organizations are very excited to bring technology to come up with innovations that technology is driving. But what that has done is that that has exposed organizations. And so it's very important that we also um, equip people when we say equip people into tech, we also want to equip people to become security professionals. And that's one of, you know, my focus is helping organizations, helping people model them into security professionals, you know, through cybersecurity awareness and through trainings like this that we're doing in tech style. And so if you're just joining us or watching us on YouTube, this is the um, tech style security learning part. And in this cohort, um, for we decided to look at identity security and we have gone through day one and day two. Please look for the videos that talk, gave us a background around Microsoft's own identity provider, which is the Microsoft Azure Active Directory. And that's what we're leveraging on to understand identity and access management. Outside work, I like traveling and I like exercising and working out. Um, okay, so we touched a bit of this last week, right? We looked at um, configuring our Azure Active Directory. So that's why a lot of you already have your tenants. Um, if you're also just joining us on day three, please try and set up your tenant using the Microsoft Developer Program, which we talked about in day one. So if you go and watch our day one video, you see where we talked about where you can create your demo tenant, right? And so um, last week we did all the way, we looked at creating users, we looked at creating groups, and so today we would, you know, speed it up to identities. During the week, um, those of you who try to get your hands on your lab, are there any questions you would like to bring to my attention? If nothing, we can, we can proceed. So today we look at configuring and managing device identities. So. We've been looking at user identities, your username, your password, creating users, but your device is also an identity. Yes, Titi, please, you can ask your question. Yes, ma. Um, I was trying to create a group. Like after creating a user, I was trying to create a group. Well, I couldn't uh, assign line since it was indicating no role assigned. No, if I click on it, it will tell me no available item. Okay, so what we do is once we run through and we get into demo session, um, instead of Franca sharing her screen for us, you will share your own screen and then we'll take it up from there. My system is done, ma. Oh, okay. So let's see what happens. If, if we're not able to get here, you can reach me after the class or during the week and then I can help you sort it out. There's no way to fix it without seeing it. Okay, ma. All right, okay. All right, so we've looked at, you know, creating user, the importance of, you know, a user, and we've understood how a user is an identity. We also want you to understand that your device is also an identity. 
you know and so the azure active directory also helps you to be able to register a device you know especially in instances where organizations are doing bring your own device you know some organizations have done their strategy their business strategy and they've checked why do we have to invest in buying people laptops you know um people go and buy the type of lap laptops you want but we'll give you everything that you need to use to work you know and some some based on the type of business some people prefer it like that i've i've happened to um be in a creative and, and, and media industry and all the creative guys prefer to use their laptops because they wanted to use different types of Mac. Some people prefer to use a particular type of Windows, you know, um, um, graphics type of devices. And so what we did was we built uh, mobile device management using the Azure Active Directory that allowed us to register those devices and still push corporate policies that could secure those devices. So when we begin to do day four, day five, day six, and do security, you see how we can protect a device, even if it's not corporate owned, and still enforce certain policies. So. The Azure Active Directory allows you to be able to register devices, right? You can use local accounts, you can use organization accounts, and you can attach this to an organization and still push resources using what we call the mobile device management, which in, in um, the Azure is called the Microsoft Intune. And it allows us to manage whether Windows 10, whether Windows 11, whether iOS or Android and Mac OS, you know, as long as it's a device, it becomes an entity that needs to be identified and needs to be granted access. And the Azure Active Directory allows us to be able to manage devices. Okay, um, so one of the ways that we can manage devices is to have them as Azure AD join, right? And, um, so today, there are two ways you can join a device to Azure AD. You can join a device directly as a cloud device, you join it to the Azure AD, or you can join it using what we call the hybrid. So if you remember in day one, I said um, back in the days before cloud, organizations would build their own data center. And so they will build their own identity um, services. And then if you wanted to use Microsoft, it was called the Microsoft Active Directory on-prem. But as cloud came, organizations began to migrate workloads from their on-prem um, data centers to the cloud. And so Microsoft allowed what we will see as we progress today, what we call the Microsoft AD Connect. And that allowed you to extend your on-prem identity to the cloud. So one of the ways you can you know, manage devices you know, on Azure Active Directory is to have what we call the um to do azure ad join so you can either join those devices you know previously we looked at here we said you can join byod that's people's devices you can register their devices without fully joining it but here you can join organization owned devices so even a device is owned by the organization one of the ways you want to register that device is to join it to the azure ad and you also want to, you know, put conditional access policies that can allow you to identify that these are corporate owned devices and these are non corporate owned devices. So when we move into conditional access policy, you will see how you can use this kind of policies to enforce rules and policies on devices, whether they are owned by the organization or they are not owned by the organization. It does not mean that security policies cannot be pushed to them. Um, this is not applicable for Windows operating systems that run home edition. So it has to either be an enterprise or professional edition. This is because of licensing, which we'll briefly look at today too. Now the hybrid Azure AD joint devices, like I mentioned, are devices that are formally joined in your on-prem active directory. So as you will see here, Back in the days, what we had, like I mentioned, was on-prem Active Directory. Those Active Directory would only serve things that were localized in that organization um, Active Directory, in that organization data center, or in that organization's network. So people would come to work. Take a typical um, teller. A teller's desktop is, sit is situated in that branch, right? Once the teller goes home, the teller is not able to assess any of the company's um, information because the device that the teller uses to connect is locked down in that building and can only access the network when in that building. And so those and the Active Directory that was managing that asset was called the Active Directory Domain Services On-Prem. And it, however, when um, cloud services came and organizations began to migrate some of their workloads into the cloud, it became important to synchronize both the cloud and the On-Prem. 
So the cloud is called the Azure Active Directory. And somewhere around here, we have what we call the AD Connect, which we'll see as we progress, the AD Connect. The AD Connect will allow us the AD Connect will allow us synchronize Active Directory on the cloud and Active Directory on-prem. And so devices that were already sitting here, example, a Tela system that was already sitting here, once you have done those synchronization to the cloud, that device will be shown on the cloud as a hybrid Azure AD. What it means is that you did not take that device and you did not join that device directly to the Active Directory. That device was only able to synchronize through the Active Directory through the on-prem. Right. So their devices, the reason why you need to understand this type of different devices is as an identity security person, when you want to begin to enforce policies, when you want to be, you must understand the identities, you know, the access that your organization has granted. What are the things that have identified you? What are the things that have connected to identity? provider you must understand these different categories so when it comes to devices you have devices that are bring your own devices byod people's individual devices that they have brought that want to assess the organization you also have devices that are corporate owned but you have joined them directly to the azure active directory and then you have another device called the hybrid azure devices devices that are connected only to the organization network however you want to synchronize them to Azure Active Directory so that you can put certain policies, but they were not joined directly to the Azure Active Directory. Does that make sense? Now we have what we call the device right back. When we use the Azure AD Connect, which I'm sure we've, on that, we've heard me say it, Azure AD Connect, don't forget, is what allows you to synchronize an on-prem Active Directory to a cloud. Now, once you have done that, what will normally happen is that when you begin to synchronize policies to those devices that are not directly joined to Azure Active Directory, the on-prem Active Directory needs to be able to see what those policies are and also enforce those policies. So we're going to see how we are configuring policies and then how does the on-prem Active Directory make sure that, okay, this user was joined to me, but this user has taken their laptop home and they're now able to do X, Y, probably they changed their password from home. The device write back functionality is what takes policy or configurations or changes that were done on a device that was locally um, joined to an on-prem and then synchronizes everything on that device back to the on-prem. So this is what happens with device write back, right? So device write back allows you to be able to say, this is a device that was registered to an on-prem active directory. However, we're enforcing certain policies using conditional access on it, but we want it to be able to synchronize all, this, um, all the registered information back to the on-prem. So when you see terminologies like device write back, that's what it's implying. Managing license. So this is, I'm sure this is around what um, TT is um, um, encountering. There are different types of licenses. I won't go into it. Uh, organizations invest in people doing licensing. Most times as a technical person, you, you do not want to spend time understanding licenses, but just know that the default, you know, just being able to have Office 365 does not automatically give you access to several of these functionalities. But the demo platform, like I mentioned to you on day one, allows us to have the full-blown Active Directory um, 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 licenses. So you might, you might not see any limitation on licenses. However, when you take it to real life scenario, ensure that you speak to license um, functionalities for your organization, which is why you must always scope, have a scope of work of what you want to do for your organization so that you can recommend the right type of licenses, right? So this is speaking to that there are different types of licenses. You have the P1, P2, you have the E3, E5, all of them come with different function, functionalities. We have licenses that you can group, you know, base wise. When we talked about dynamic policies, remember when we said that in dynamic policies, sorry, dynamic grouping um, last week, we spoke about that. You can assign people to group using dynamic um, um, expressions. So you can assign somebody to group manually. You create a user, you look for the group you assign. However, imagine you have 50, 60, 100 users. Do you want to be assigning them one by one? So let's assume you have a particular license that XYZ people need to use. So for those of you in Power BI, so let's assume that you, you have XYZ people that you have created dashboards for and they need Power BI license, right? And that department is about 50 to 60 people. Does it mean that the identity person has to go into Azure, 
one by one start assigning people licenses. No. So typically what the person will do is do what we call group-based type of licensing. So using a dynamic rule, right? So you create a dynamic group and can look for a unique feature, um, syntax and put. These are some of the things we practice in, in, in your labs. And then you will now be able to assign that license. So anybody that matches, so it could be that, oh, it is the people in finance that this Power BI dashboard, and they want everybody in finance to have a Power BI license. You can create a group, okay? And in that group, you are signing the Power BI license. And then you make that group dynamic that says, anybody in HR department, sorry, in finance department should be assigned to this group. And that group automatically has Power BI. So what happens is anybody in finance with that maybe signed as maybe you use the department um, properties, will fall into that group and automatically that person will get a Power BI license. So you can also assign licenses, you know, understanding people's access rights and identity rights and then be able to do that. You can also use this same group-based licensing method to remove licenses without manually doing, sorry, without doing it manually. Okay. Um, Franka, do you want to share your screen? Let's quickly look at how to assign a license manually. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. You know you have many, many, many logins. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wrote I wrote that down. That's why I was looking okay. for it. Yeah. Okay. Um I should go to Azure Portal. Portal dot Azure. Demo is the demo one. Okay, that's it here. Is it different? Later. Okay, so where, where do you want me to go? Okay, what is this? All right, go to your Azure Active Directory, yeah? Okay. Yes. Next week, I'm not going to tell you where to go. I will expect you to be in the Azure okay. Active Directory. And then we we'll okay. go to users. Okay. So it's because you said you want us to do licenses. So yes. I thought it was a different place. Okay. Yeah. So um, so click on, yeah, you can click on my name. We can do this from the Microsoft 365, but I always want us to do everything from the Azure Active Directory, just because as an identity administrator, most times this is where you'll be working from. Now from the left, you will see licenses. So you can see that no license has been assigned to this user. So let's go to assignment. Okay. Um, if you look at, click on Microsoft Teams. So that's the only license that you have on this, your demo. We will have to go back to check again the when you were setting it up, you did not add the one, but this is it. So depending on an organization, you'll see different types of licensing, licenses that are available. Um, we haven't activated the, the others, but Microsoft Team is the only one available in this subscription now, and we've assigned it. Now, let's assume inside the Microsoft Teams, we don't want to assign this person a SharePoint kiosk, or we don't want to assign this person a whiteboard. You will just uncheck the buttons of the ones you don't want to assign to the user. And that's it. So, and the ones you want to assign for the years, that's it. And then you save. You have assigned a license to a user. That's
that's how easy um, it is. So just select save. Okay, I, I guess it's because it's um, okay, but it just is Microsoft Teams free. So what, what else are we expected to see there? When you were starting up the demo platform, there are many options it gave you there. Maybe you didn't click on it, so it only gave you Teams. Okay, okay. Because like I said, in the real world too, you will have to buy licenses. You don't just, creating a tenant does not automatically give you all the license. Okay. Okay, do you want me to go to the other, um, the other tenant to see if uh, we'll have the different licenses? Okay. So um, why do I go here? Users, so go to, yeah, go to any of the users. Okay. I guess so. And then licenses. So you can see this user is assigned this type. So if you go to assignments, you can, are you, okay. are you, are you so you can okay. see other type of licenses. So it also depends. So this is what I'm expecting everybody to see: the Microsoft 365 E5 developer license. That's the license that gives us everything. So if you scroll down, you will see all the Microsoft components available. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when we're creating, um, if we wanted to create a group based um, licensing group, we can come and say for Power BI users, they don't need all this other thing. We want to select only Power BI. And anybody inside that group will only have Power BI, they won't have every other thing. Okay, so this means that all these are selected for this person. Yes. So if in an organization, what this means is you want to be doing it one by one. So we're first of all learning how to assign license to a particular user. But I'm saying, imagine you have to do the same thing to 500 users. Do you want to do it one by one? So we use what we call the group based licensing, where you would have as a, is it a department? Remember, we're doing identity and assets. So we must understand what's the assets that this person needs. Oh, this person needs only email and then needs um, SharePoint and needs OneDrive and needs this. Then we create a group called XYZ name and then come here, uncheck the things that the person doesn't need, leave the ones that they need, assign it to that group. And then dynamically, when people go into that group, they will pick up that. We don't have to manually be going to their user account and be editing licenses. Okay. So for instance, if you go back to home, oh. home, yeah, Azure Active Directory, groups,
we can say new group. Give it any name. Sorry? Give it any name. Call it okay. test. A description for the group. No, change the group Plus size to dynamic. Up the first item. Oh. Oh, that's a good type. Okay. Um, there is no option for dynamic here. Why is it not showing for you? Okay. All right. Leave it as security group, that's fine. Then okay. come down. Membership type. Dynamic. Dynamic. Yeah. User. User or device. User. Okay, scroll down. Dynamic query. No, please, sorry, please go. Okay, so we need, let me get a dynamic query we can use. Okay. Okay, the dynamic query is compulsory, I put that. Yeah, because you made it a dynamic group, so you must put a dynamic query. Okay, so is it um, where you have group description I need to put there? Oh, well, that could no, be no. there. Okay. Okay, that no, it's okay. if you ah, put there. I need to no, so we need to we need okay, to have one, a, a dynamic query. So okay, you need to you send that to me or something. Yes. Okay. So the rule will look like something like this. Um, uh, could you um, explain dynamic membership again? When do we have the dynamic membership? Sorry, your question. Uh, could you explain dynamic membership again, please? Okay, dynamic membership is, I don't want to, okay, can you cancel this? Cancel this and let's go back, let me show you. Let's go back to, go back to all groups. Go back one step backward. No, 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 don't do that from the down, back again. Here. Yeah. Back again. Back. Okay. Right here? When, yes. Now, this is a group. We want to create a group. Let's say we want to create a group called Power BI Group, right? Okay. So you have your Power BI users. You have created your dashboard, and people that need to see your Power BI dashboard, you want to put them in a group. So you've told the identity person to create a group for you called Power BI. That's the identity. You want to use it to identify maybe HR Power BI users or Finance Power BI users. So you come here and click on New Group. Okay. That's the first ideal thing to do. And then expand it. Now, if you hover your mouse on top of the, the description beside group type. 
group type. No, don't just hover your mouse on top of group type. Exactly. You can see that security group is used to give group members access to applications, resources, and assign licenses. Group members can be users, device, service people. Microsoft 365 group are used for collaboration and they need to share mailboxes, calendar, SharePoint sites, and so on. Group members can only be users. So there are two types of group. You have a security group, you have an M365 group. If you put, if you create a security group, it means that you're going to use it to do things like application permissions, resources permission, license permission. But if you take a M365 group, and then security group allows you to put service accounts, devices, but in Microsoft 365 group, you can only do users. Devices cannot be in the Microsoft 365 group. So as an identity person, remember you're trying to secure an organization. So the first thing you want to do is understand the different types of assets. So if people say that if you if the assets you want to give is user-based assets, and that user-based assets, all they want to do is assess an application, in this instance, Power BI, then it's a security group. That is yeah. a security group type. But if what they want to do is that they want to be able to assess a SharePoint site, a OneDrive site, then it becomes an M365 group. Okay, so, I mean, you just give them access to their groups. Yeah, what they, yeah? No, you want to first yeah, of all, decide the type of group. Okay, yeah, so group them. Grouping, grouping enables you grant access to a group of people with collective or related requirement required access. Okay. Join this Power BI access. Franka needs Power BI access. As an administrator, I'm saying today, just to what if you have 1,000 users, are you going to be going to each of those 1,000 users to give them access? Okay. In an oh. world, it is, the answer is no. So mm -hmm. you have a part of your identity and access management improvement is that you can use grouping to group users based on the type of access that they need. Okay. You can yeah. give access to individuals, but you're only doing that in a demo environment because it's one or two. In the real world, when you go into a typical work environment, you will have 1,000 users, 5,000 users. I work in an organization that I've done 13,000 users. Will I go one by one to 13,000 users to give them license? No. So what do you do? You use group type of method. Now, to understand the type of group, I need to understand the type of access that they need. So I gave an example here and I said, take a scenario of a group of people who need Power BI access. But yeah. what if what they want is SharePoint access, then a M365 group type is what you will select. If what they want is access to an application, in this instance, we're saying Power BI, we'll give them security group. So we select a security group, then we create the group name. Now the membership type is, how are you going to assign members to this group? That's the meaning of membership type. Group name is any unique name you want to use to add. So we can say finance Power BI users. We can say HR Power BI users. It does, naming convention is based on organization. Okay. Mm. Now you come to the next item on that list is membership type. If you look, click on the drop down, you will see assigned and you will see dynamic. Okay, so now, um, so, do you want me to put the group name here? Yes, please. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So if you go to membership type, you will see assigned. Membership type. That's the next, just be taking it one by one, Franka. You're jumping. Yeah. We're going, no, yeah. You're, each of the item you finish group name what's the next thing okay okay so, so i can explain then, now you have assigned you have dynamic user you have dynamic device what does this mean assigned is i'm going to be manually assigning people to this group that's the meaning of assigned so if you create a group and you select assign what it means is that you will always be the one who manually comes to put people in this group is it realistic in a real corporate environment? No. 
In a green corporate environment, is it realistic to in some kind of use cases? Yes. But eventually, if it is a it is if it's a service account group that has restrictive kind of policy, you want to make sure that anybody who gets into that group is it maybe goes through an approval. And once that approval is done, you pull manually go and assign people here. I'm saying that we must understand that this course is to teach you as an identity and access administrator, the importance of you applying security. And that's why the course started first of all to explain to you what an identity and asset administrator does. If you don't understand it, you cannot secure because you don't even know what they do. So when you come and you are saying, I want to do access review of all your groups and they export all the groups and you see the ones that are dynamic, you don't even understand what it means. How then do you know if the organization is granting access that hackers can exploit? You need to understand what do these things mean from an access and identity perspective so I can apply the right security, which is what we start learning in day four and day five. Okay. So if I see a group and the group is called assigned, I know that that group can never be populated unless somebody manually goes and puts people inside that group. If I see a group called dynamic user, I know that then that means there's a dynamic expression assigned to that group that automatically matches users to that group. I want to now go and look at what is this expression so I can understand who is matching that expression and how it is populating. Please, I will encourage you guys to take your time to do the labs. No matter how much I explain it, if you don't get familiar with it in the lab, you won't have the understanding. The essence for the teaching is to give you a background. The lab is to help you know how to do it. From experience, I have sat down in trainings and when people finish training, Everybody is excited, but when they go home, they never still know. So you see people that have done lots of training, lots of certifications, but they cannot handle real world because they don't go for hands on. That's why I'm not the one clicking, clicking. I would encourage us to spend time in doing the exercises. When you click, click, make those mistakes and we come to the class here and you ask, then we can troubleshoot your mistake. But it will only make sense when you do it on your own. So where do we get the labs then? It's in the document I shared. I shared it with everybody. Um, on the, where did you share? On the Discord, the outline, oh, okay. on each of the outline, there's a row that puts the link to all the labs. Okay, it's there. I, didn't, I didn't see that. Okay. Yes, Titi. Yes, ma. I from this lab, I'm trying to understand. I realize uh, Franca opened um, admin. That's where she first the first login was from admin. So why are we going to create admin user? Maybe that's the reason I couldn't get a license because the the account I used is the one I created through that uh, the first lab we did. From, uh, if, your lap, if your laptop was here, I'll sort you out. What you're explaining, I can't help you out because you don't have a system to show me what you're saying. Okay, so what Franca is doing is, is the normal way we did it from day one. Once you go to the Azure Active and click on your subscription, it will land you here. The only thing Franca has done is that she, she has two different labs. She has a lab that has lots of users and she has another lab that has only two users. That's all. There's no admin anything. Okay. So try as much as possible, either during the week or if your laptop comes on later today, call me on WhatsApp and let's connect and let me explain to you. It will not be beneficial to you and that's the truth. I can talk in this class. It will not be beneficial to you if you don't do the exercises. I've done this job for over 12 years. The only way you can understand it is when you do it yourself. You don't, it's not, it's not a cram and pour. It's not like in university. Mm -mm, there's no cram and pour here. You need to do it. You need to say, you need to create an assigned user. You need to create a dynamic group. You need to create a dynamic device group. And then you now understand. And everything, each of these scenarios is in that exercise. 
So what's the difference between the dynamic user and the dynamic device? Dynamic user is it is um, it is only applicable to a user account. Dynamic device is applicable to a device. Okay. So remember, we have said that in identity, a user account is an identity. A device is an identity. Oh. As an identity oh. security person, you want to know what are the type of devices that are connecting to our environment. And you also want to know what are the type of users that are connecting to our environment. They are all identities that you grant access authorization. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to skip this because if we, if not, we're not going to we're not going to meet up next week. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. No. no, I said so. I'm switching back to my. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, I rather run through the slide and then we can we can spend time doing the demo. But I need to, I need us to catch up. If not next week, we'll meet up. Okay. So I should stop sharing with you. Yes, please. So we're looking at custom security attributes. When we hear the name custom, what it means is that you can customize it. Microsoft has allowed you to be able to create custom security attributes that you can use to segment identities. So if you go to the um, user where you have your users at the lower end, you will see where it calls custom security attributes and you can add an attribute. What is an attribute? An attribute is something you want to use to be able to put like a placeholder on a on an identity. So you can have contractors. Your business can involve where vendors come in and you want to be able to say, every time we create an account for a vendor, we want a unique attribute that tells us that this is a vendor account. So that once we create this user, the user doesn't just enter the group of users and automatically gets access into everything that we give users in our organization. We probably want to say that all users should be able to assess this, but if you have attributes, contractor do not assess it. What I want you to put in your subconscious mind is, how would I protect my organization? How will I protect the organization that I'm working from an identity and access perspective? So it starts by conceptualizing how the people get access. So the identity provider allows you to create custom attributes so that you can say anytime we create contractors, put a custom attribute called maybe C-O-N-T-R. So that when we are creating policies, we can now say this attribute, C-O-N-T-R, anybody that has it should not be able to log in from China or should not be able to do X, Y, Z, because we know they are contractors and we don't want to allow our contractors logging into our network, maybe after 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. We want, we, yes, they are our contractors. Yes, we want staffs to be able to, staffs to have access and work anytime, but we want to make sure that anytime contractors are working, it is only during work hours. So we create a custom attribute. We assign it to our contractors. And then we create a conditional access policy that says, if you have this custom attribute that we know is for contractor, we will say to deny logon from XYZ period. These are the ways that you manage identity and access and increase the security landscape of your organization. So 
when you set up the tenant, what you actually did when you were setting up your tenant was that you were setting up your Azure Active Directory tenant. The tenant subscription was done for you and fictitious users were created for you and you saw them. Now, all of these things that I'm putting here are just ways to fine tune. If you're doing core security, it might not be your role to do this, right? But it might be things that you want to point out. For instance, if people want to log into your login page, it's very important that you brand it so that people can know when they are logging into a page that is not the company one. So as a security person, the first thing you want to also tell the identity administrator is that, you know, have they branded the page? So Microsoft Identity allows you to be able to brand your company page. Like I said, if you don't get your hands on with these areas, when we start to do policies and things, you struggle because you don't even know where these things are. And all of this is in the lab. This is what will help you appreciate this identity and the Azure identity. So you can customize and brand your page. You can create a logo. You can create a language. You can say login pages you only land with English. So you, you can create different landing pages so that maybe the people in, I have worked in an organization where we had subsidiaries in France with this. You can customize it that the people in France get their landing page displayed for them in French, while people in the English speaking countries get that. The Azure AD also can be assessed by the global administrator and different types of um, admin, admin users. One thing that should stick to you is Azure AD is the is the identity, Microsoft Azure. So the way you have your AWS, you have your Google, right? You have your um, Oracle. That's how you have the Azure. That's the cloud platform. And the AD is the identity provider. Now, inside the identity provider, you have different types of roles. You have IT admin, you have developers. Everybody cannot be an, a full administrator. So it's also very important that you understand roles. So, that's where segregation of duty comes in. So if you have five in the department, even though I'm in identity department, should I be able to change policies? Maybe I can create users, but should I be able to change policies? The reason why you want to do segregation of duties is just so that if for adventure anybody gets compromised, how do you containerize that compromise? So you want to make sure that you give roles to only people who need roles to. So in, you go to, if you go to the Azure Active Directory, you will see different Azure AD custom roles, um, existing roles, and then you can also create your own custom roles in your organization. You can create custom roles. So for instance, if people have overlapping functions, if somebody can, needs to do this, but still do this, you can now create your custom role because probably the Microsoft default Azure roles do not have the mix match of those functions. The reason why you also want to do custom roles is so that organizations will not say, but we're not plenty in our team. You can't tell us that every, give everybody full access so that you say, no, what do people need to do, and then you can segregate it and then create custom rules and not assume that everybody needs full admin access. Roles can also be assigned to users, like I explained. There's everything, you can do everything on a user by user basis, and you can do everything on a group basis. The benefit of group basis is that it helps you remove the mundane manual tax of doing things one by one. And the concept of role membership allows us to practicalize this, one of the zero trust rules, which is least privilege. With doing custom rules, we can only make sure that, okay, people are getting only what they need to. They're not getting everything. Again, this is exercise. It's in the, um, in the document I shared. Not to overflog it, you know, again, Azure AD roles can be assigned at any level. When you begin to expand your function as an Azure Active Directory person, you are the ones that will assign people to virtual machines. You're the ones that will assign people to subscriptions. You are the ones that need to assign people to, to their containers, their Kubernetes. 
all of these things are determined by the type of Azure rules. So it's also very important that you understand what's the benefit of Azure rules. For Azure Active Directory, the rules extend to everything that sits in Azure because Azure AD is the identity provider of Microsoft Azure. So administrative units restrict permission in a role to any portion of your organizations that you define. Like I've mentioned, you use the administrative units to contain your users and to contain your groups. A typical scenario here is look at a large university that is composed of many autonomous schools. So they have the School of Business, School of Engineering, and so on. Each of the school has a team of IT admin who control access, manage users, and set policies for their school. Administrative task could be create a role with administrative permission only Azure AD users in the business school unit. So this is a typical example. You can, in one of the projects I'm, I'm putting, I'm putting actually this, you know, think about it that you have school of business, you have school of engineering. Now the, uh, the person who is the IT admin for school of business is not the same IT admin for school of engineering. So what that means is that you will have maybe two I am IT admin groups. You have IT admin for school of business. You have IT admin for school of engineering so that you can now assign them, each of them to the group of users that belong to that, to that, um, to that category. So that the IT admin in school of business will not automatically be making changes that impact school of engineering. These are the kind of scenarios where you do segregation of duties and use administrative tax to delegate um, Azure roles. The default Azure AD rules come with, you know, permission rights. And if you, if you look at them, their, their description is there. A role will tell you what you can do. So you can see a role that will tell you, oh, this person can view enumerate list of users. This person can invite guest users. This person can change password. This person can manage photo. This person can create groups. So when you now have a scenario that says, create different IT admin. This IT admin is supposed to do a, this IT admin, you're supposed to now identify this existing default Azure AD role. Does it match all the things that I've been told this user will do? If some of the permissions there are too much based on that organization's own IT admin role, you create a custom one and you can duplicate existing roles and then rename it and then filter and remove the permissions that you don't want. Ideally, best practice, that's in real life scenario, best practice, that's what I always tell people to do. I tell them not to use existing roles because most of the built-in roles have some features that are overkill to your organization. So I always, if somebody says, oh, we want to create application administrators and application administrators exist on Azure AD, I will typically duplicate application administrator and then custom it, put the organization's name in front or the department's name in front and then make sure that each of the permissions that exist there is applicable to that department. So this is a typical user setting where you can restrict, you know, some, um, some administrative rules allow you to create app registration. So because what this means is that if somebody's account is compromised, the person can automatically create a bot in your tenant and be using your tenant to spam people and be using your tenant to, to create phishing attacks to organizations. And once Microsoft sees that IP address attached to you, they block your tenant and your tenant will not be able to do anything. But you do not know that the rights that you gave Joy as a user gave her the ability to be able to create apps. Meanwhile, all I just needed to do was be able to create users, but on the user profile, these are additional um, permissions that I have. So you can actually go and restrict it. You can restrict it on a user basis. You can restrict it on a role base. Like I said, that's why in real life scenario, best practice, I always say create custom roles, duplicate from the existing ones, customize, edit it, and then customize it to what is applicable to that organization. 
always analyze your permissions. Don't just inherit permissions. Permissions are things that allow an organization to get compromised. Yesterday I was in a session and there was an audit that was done for file server. So when they create the file server, they automatically share, when they share the file server location, they added everyone. So what that means is that no matter if inside that folder you now create HR, create, they've already said that everyone should have full permission at the root. Everyone should have full permission at the root. The risk about that is that it means that if somebody's account, who may be even a junior person who doesn't have proper cybersecurity hygiene, gets compromised and the threat actor comes into the organization, they'll be able to get access to finance people's shared folder because of that wrong configuration. So it's very important that we analyze permissions that we give to identities. <clears throat> now you can add your, your tenant and customize it to a custom domain. Um, if you look at your domains, they are all very funny domains that have been created. But in real life, when an organization is creating, you know, their tenants, they want to customize it so that it is unique to the organization. So that's why you see um, the organizations that you work for or you eventually work for will carry unique domain customization. It will be good that you go through and see how to add custom domains, okay? So that you can, you know, understand that, oh, is this how they add the custom domain? and then add a custom domain to yours and then see how it looks. When we say tenant wide settings, there are configurations that you do that apply to everybody. So it's very important also that you understand configurations that are tenant wide and that are user wide and that are group wise. So, you can configure your tenant such a way that, oh, people can log in into their profile using LinkedIn, or people can log into their profile and it must require MFA, and people can log into their profile and it must require ABCD. There are certain configurations that we do at the tenant level because we want that policy applied to everybody. We don't want it to be only for certain people. Those configurations, we do them at the tenant level. Tenant is what Microsoft calls that configuration that they, that subscription that they've given you, they call it is your own tenant, just like the way you become a tenant to a property. A landlord gives you his house. You're not the owner of the house, but you are the tenant occupying the house. That's how Microsoft is. So you're not the owner of Microsoft infrastructure, but when you get a subscription, you become a tenant. And so they create that um, house for you so that you become that tenant. So you can do things like user settings where, you can restrict and say, okay, a user can be able to access administrative portal, or user cannot, a user can register an application, or a user cannot, or a user can log in, can link their corporate account with their LinkedIn account. So if you're an organization that you guys don't want your corporate identity to be merged with social media identity, and some businesses are like that. Imagine people working in DSS, working in FBI and all of that. They wouldn't want to synchronize staff um, um, corporate accounts with social media accounts. So this setting automatically would be disabled. What if you don't know it exists? These are settings that Microsoft has left by default and the synchronization will just work. So that's why they are sending people that don't know that they their company has this setting and you can just go and search. So Miriam, can you remember when you went and you saw a name on your tenant and you saw the person on LinkedIn and she was scared that this looks like a real life person. And I said, yes. The person actually works for Microsoft and was used as a demo name on the demo tenant. And it exists because LinkedIn settings has been disabled. So in that your tenant, you can go to that your user under this user settings and, and disable LinkedIn connection. So that's why it was possible for you to see those kind of things because these configurations are enabled. So in some organization, they do not want this kind of synchronization. As an identity person, you must understand it and disable it. If you don't even know it exists, you won't even know how to recommend it. The same thing with um, external collaboration. Some organizations collaborate with external people and 
typically what you see people do is they'll be sending themselves emails with attachments back and forth, filling up their mailboxes. So an organization can come and say, our business requires us to collaborate with external people and share lots of documents. And so on your Azure identity, you can configure how an organization can safely collaborate with external users. So those users are not existing on their platform, but because they want to collaborate with them, they want to share applications with them, they want to create applications and have them connect. You can do these configurations on the identity provider and be specific to that it is for external users and that this setting is not for your internal corporate users. Also on your tenant properties, you can do things like private policies so that um, especially around GDPR now, who to contact. So if an organization has service decks, so that when people get error during login, they can just pop and see their service desk number and they can call. These are where you can do all those customization. So at, at the login page, you can see service desk number, service desk you are, you can see company private policy, statement and global policy statement so that people understand that this is a corporate environment. We are guided by this statement. Um, all of this is tied to here. You can actually even see where your tenant was created under the tenant properties. So if you're an organization that is strictly enforced that you cannot create your tenant in another region, this is the place you can use to prove. So if audit comes and say, prove to us that you know your Microsoft tenant is not, so you know this fight between the Russians and the whole, um, um, do they call them the G8 or what? Some, some organizations cannot go and create their tenants in these other countries. So when audit is coming, they must prove this is where you go to get the identity location and prove that your tenant is not breaking the, com the country law for where you can host your services. So who is a guest user? A guest user is an external user that you have invited to join your corporate Azure AD. A user that is not provisioned on your corporate environment, but you have brought that user to join. A user from probably your social media partners and services that you have brought in to be able to consume your Active Directory functionality. So like I said, it can be your partner, it can be your vendor, it can be your supplier. And these people need to authenticate to your Azure AD, right? What do you do? You create them as guest users. They will get an invitation that they have been profiled on your platform. They will redeem that invitation, set up their account, and then they'll be able to now log in into your platform. So for instance, if you have a vendor management portal that you have built in your Azure tenant, and then you want that all vendors should be able to log into the vendor management portal and upload maybe their invoices and upload their company profile. We don't want them sending us, but we want them to be able to, when they're authenticating that their identity is not our at, at uh, let's not take it our domain is Contoso. So they are, we don't want them to use at Contoso. We want them to use that their personal email account. But when they're coming in, we want to see that it is an email address that we have approved in our tenant. So we send them an invitation, we create them, it will send them an invitation. And then once they redeem that invitation, they'll be able to now log back as a user into our environment. So this is one of the things you can test out your time. You take another of your email address, not the email address you used to do your demo and go to new user, guest user, create that user, you get the email, you accept the email, go through the process, and then you will now see that you automatically can come in into that tenant as a guest user, not as a main user. So Azure Active Directory allows you to do business to business collaboration, like we've seen. So you are a guest user sitting here, you know, you can be able to talk to this company through any of your methods, through your login details, through your LinkedIn, through your Facebook, you can be able to send emails to them 
and all of this is because of the Active Directory business to business integration, right? And beyond just the Active Directory, because of the Azure AD Connect that links the Azure Active Directory to on-prem, you find out that you can still be able to extend this person to the on-prem environment and to the cloud apps using their external identity. So we mentioned, you invite the external users to your tenant, they would um, use their existing credentials for authentication. Then based on the permission that you have assigned them, you can now restrict what the external user can see or do using things like, so we can enforce multi-factor authentication for all external users so that anyone that is not, we must use 2FA so that we know that a random person is not. And the reason why we first of all create invite is so that any ID person, we don't want to open our external collaboration and say anybody external. So we open our external collaboration to only guest users. So you must be profiled as a guest user first before you can even be able to log in into our tenant. Another place you can view, <coughs> so like I explained to you that lots of things we'll be doing will be on the Azure Active Directory, but we have what we call the M365 Admin Center. So that's what I was trying, I think Titi was trying to talk. And I say, Titi, I intentionally am not navigating between the Azure Active Directory and the Admin Center so that you don't get confused. But another place that you can run management and administration is the Admin Center. But the Admin Center is not the, I, I, the Admin Center is not the identity provider. So there's a limitation to some of the administrative duties you can do there but the admin center can still allow you to see your guest users and create your guest users there. Okay. Yeah. So, but as an identity person, you must get familiar with the Azure AD. That's where, that is the identity provider. So it has lots of functionality that you will not see in the M3 site, especially when we, when, when we start day four, when we're now implying um, imputing security policies, you will not see the ability to do it in the M365. Which is why I'm very intentional not to have us use it. So some of the things that an external collaboration can do is you can enable chat, anonymous meetings, join team sharing, site sharing. That's why a lot of you are connected to textilers tenants today, all using your personal profile. So when you signed up for the course, you gave them your personal email because external collaboration has been enabled, your personal emails were all created as guest accounts. And so you are now able to connect in Teams. We can see each other in Teams. We can share files in Teams, we can share calendars in Teams. You can join our meeting because they have enabled external collaboration. And as you can see, these things are enabled. Some of them are enabled by default. So it's very important that if an organization says, we don't want people to be able to chat with external people, you have to come and then disable this. But you must understand that these things are enabled by default for external collaboration. So if an organization says, we don't want our people to be able to use our company teams to host outside meetings with external people, things should be only for internal people, then you have to come and ensure that the team's administrator disable these functionalities. So you have the ability to grant people and remove guest access. You know, like we said again, zero principle. Never assume that, oh, because we've enabled external collaboration, everybody, no. The zero principle is we must always come back to check, you know, which is where governance comes in. Governance is we come have governance processes that allow us to do periodic checks. So maybe it's every three, three months, every 90 days, we go and review our guest list and say, who are these guest people, you know? Who are they? Why are they here? And then we get approval to remove them because we feel that they've been in the tenant for more than 90 days and haven't logged in, and we don't want to leave rogue accounts. The same way you can create your users individually and in bulk is the same way you can create guest accounts individually and in bulk. I've worked in an organization where HR used to host, um, HR used to host. I call these HMOs, 
So, you know, HM must have different customers for different companies. And so they used to host like this monthly health awareness. And so when they want to do this monthly health awareness, because they have different companies that they want, they get the people who have signed up. So the people who have signed up for their own HMO, they get their identity and they create them as guest users so that they can join those sessions because the things that are going to be shared in that session, they probably do not want people to be able to copy it out, screen, grab it. So when those users connect with their guest assets, that policy is enforced on that account and can restrict them what they can do during that meeting session. I'm sure some of you, I don't know if you remember, I think about five, six years ago, the first time Access Bank laid off people, they had a town hall and that town hall was held on Zoom. I think it was during when Zoom just came out and somebody, you know, recorded, recorded the Zoom session. I know today, yes, you can put your phone and record, but as at that time, so much awareness was not even this thing, but it was because the person had a user ability to record. Now, organizations do it that only certain people, when they um, set up meetings, can record, just so that everybody is not recording and take out corporate data. And so when you're allowing guest people come into your tenants to do meetings with you, you also want to enforce those kind of things. So you use the guest methods where you can now enforce policies, say, if a guest user, the person should not be able to initiate a record session. So you can create users individually or in bulk, because there are scenarios where you have bulk guest users. By default, your guest users will not have roles. They will not have group membership. They will not have licenses, but you can add them. So once you create guest users, they don't have all of these things. That's why we said we can create these dynamic groups and all of that so that we can say, once somebody is a guest user, maybe the person enters XYZ dynamic group so that the policy for maybe enforcing multi-factor authentication can be, you know, can begin to apply to the person. But by default, these capabilities do not uh, or are not enforced on guest users. Make sure you assign least privileged access to guest users. So if somebody says this guest user should be able to see XYZ file, you should understand why. Why should I make a guest user a, a help desk administrator? Why should I make a guest user XYZ administrator? Or why a group administrator? Understand the need for this access control so that we can make sure that we are assigning the least privilege access needed. Cross tenant access control in this instance, we, we will not be able to um, explore this lab because um, we just have one tenant, but cross tenant is there are times that you're an identity administrator for an organization that has multiple tenants. And so they want to be able to allow those two tenants to be able to collaborate. There are configurations that you can do. So if you have a parent company and a child company, so if you are an identity administrator and you guys have subsidiaries, you want to be able to allow your tenants to be able to collaborate. So you can configure cross tenant access control that can say that I'm an, I'm an administrator in tenant A, but I still want to be able to be the same administrator in tenant B, even though they are two different tenants. But because we own them, there are ways to set up the cross tenant settings so that you can have this access. You mainly see it around organizations that have um, what we call subsidiaries. Okay. There are instances where people want to use Google as the identity provider um, or any other identity provider. We have the ability to do those integrations where you can say, so for me, my own Microsoft developer program, I'm using my Gmail account, right? So the ability for us to be able to use our Gmail on Microsoft platform is because Microsoft has synchronized with Google as an identity provider and say, okay, you want, we know that there are users who still use your email. Instead of having them create another email on our platform, they can still use your email. But I want to be able to come to you as the identity provider and validate this user. And once you get back to me to say, yes, this user is truly on my tenant and this username and password the person provided is correct, 
then I will authorize the person to assess my resources. So we allow, you know, identity providers, um, third party identity providers, you can do for Google, you can do for Facebook. So that's why setting applications too, you try to log in today, you will see that when you see sign up, you will still see they put Google, they put Facebook, they put LinkedIn, is because they have extended their existing identity provider with those third parties so that you don't have to put your username, so you don't have to create new username, create new email, create all of these things. They go to your identity provider, they validate that it's you, and based on the response that they receive, they authorize and grant you access. We will skip <coughs> verifiable credentials to, I think, day five, because that's where we have the main content for verifiable credentials. Just so that we have an idea, we will not be able to explore this in real life because we don't have any on-prem active directory. But I'll just reiterate, we did this at the beginning where I said, for you to be able to connect your on-prem to your Azure cloud, you need what we call the Azure Active Directory Connect. So we call it, we normally call it the AD Connect. When you set up the AD Connect in your on-prem environment, that is what allows you to be able to, that is what allows you to be able to connect the cloud and your on-prem so that your users that are on-prem can still consume cloud services. So the Azure AD will be doing things like synchronization, password hash synchronization, pass through authentication, federation integration and health monitoring. What does that mean? My account is created in my on-prem active directory as joy.mnm, but I want to be able to access an application that is hosted on the cloud. Because of the AD Connect, when I log into the cloud, the AD Connect sees that, okay, this account is not on my on-prem active directory. Can I check if the account is, sorry, this account is not on my cloud active directory. Can I check if the account is on-prem and the user goes on-prem using your password, sends your password hash to your on-prem and your on-prem returns back to say yes. And then the on uh, cloud active directory can now allow you to assess that cloud resources. So if you're in an organization that maybe application people are already moving to the cloud, but user entities are still on-prem. Once you put in an Azure Active Directory, you can still allow people to authenticate because you can set up this way to synchronize password hash and be able to do password authentication and synchronization from your on-prem to the cloud. Unfortunately, because we don't have an on-prem environment, we might not be, we, we can't be able to simulate this for you to see how it works. And it leverages on things like AD Connect, um, Cloud Sync. These are all the things it will do from time to time, just so that it can move um, those passwords to the cloud and from the cloud back. Sorry, um, could you go back um, two slides so that, um, could you explain that again? I missed out, yes. Okay. Please, could you explain the Azure Active Directory Connect again? So remember I said that before cloud, organizations were building their identity provider in their data center on-prem. Before cloud came into existence, what you will have is your company will create your username and password for you in an on-prem active directory. So you find out that you can only work when you come to the office. The moment you go out of the office, you cannot do anything. As companies began to expand, in fact, many companies didn't know what to do until COVID hit them. People could not work because they were not in the office. For them to be able to consume Microsoft Cloud services, they needed to set up what we call the Azure, the Active Directory Connect, AD Connect. The AD Connect will now sit in your on-prem data center and take your password from your on-prem Active Directory, synchronizing it to the Azure Cloud. So that you as a user, you can still consume those cloud services. And the way it does it is through synchronization, password has synchronization, pass through authentication. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Oh. 
So for AD Connect, like I said, it will use things like password hash. Your users will still maintain their username and password with on-prem. It will just be the one that will be passing that authentication to the cloud on behalf of your users. When your users change the password, it will sync it. So this is a typical logical explanation of what happens. You have your Active Directory Forest that you already have in your on-prem. Then you have your Azure AD in the cloud. And then you have the AD Connect. So the AD Connect will import users and then start to sync this user's metaverse to, the, to Azure AD and sync them back when their change is made. So there's a little SQL database here that is doing the sync inward and outward that enables your cloud Azure Active Directory still allow you to use your on-prem users to authenticate. I've explained this again. Your password hash is on-prem AD Connect, taking your password, hashing them. So when we say password hash, your password is not in clear text. It just takes the hash value and move it here. Your password still retains on your on-prem server. It only takes the hash value and moves it to the Azure Active Directory. A typical setup of an AD Connect is it's one of the most easiest configuration to ever do. It's very, the GUI is very straightforward to ask you what type of, um, synchronization method you want to do, we mainly advise and recommend password hash um, so that the passwords are not sent in clear text, but the hash values are what we use to pass to um, AD Connect. Okay, I need to pull up another slide. So this is more, I put these videos too for you to demo and watch. Federation also is using AD Connect. We don't have AD Connect here, so we'll skip all of this. Any questions so far? Could you explain the, sorry, could you explain the Federation again? Federation is you saying that I have an entity on-prem and I want that entity to federate with my cloud. So I bring up a federation service. In this example, we are using Azure AD Connect. Don't forget your on-prem, your on-prem. That's why I asked for the background of before we started because you must understand that back in the days, on-prem was a network isolated to itself. Cloud is internet. On-prem is not internet. The fact that when you are in your on-prem infrastructure, you have internet access, the logical network topology, that internet access you are accessing when you are in your office, doesn't, it was, can be taken away from you. There were organizations that did not even have internet access, where people would come to the work and be able to access their company email file share applications, core banking, but they cannot do internet. But because we're in cloud, so take COVID happened, people could not come to the office, but they were at home working. Why? The organization just needed to do federation, extend what was here and federate it with the cloud so that they can still use that username and password and work. That's what federation means. But for you to federate, you need to use a particular technology most people are using the Azure AD Connect technology to federate their on-prem infrastructure with their cloud. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Titi Miriam, any question? Trying to open the guides to see how far we've done. No, ma. Not for now. No, ma. Yes.
Okay, so we've done this day two announce wide. If you look at here, we've come. Yeah, we've done cross tenant access control, identity providers, implement and manage verifiable ID. Let's give this. So next week is we're going to start from here, which is the Azure AD multi-factor authentication. So does anybody want us to look through their demo platform and fix anything that is not working? Did you guys see this document when I shared it? Yes, ma. I'm so actually... Can you see the exercises here? Okay, so you, you have it on... Um... <laughs> On uh, Discord, yeah? Yeah. So when okay. you click on each of the exercises, it will take you to the GitHub that has all the, the requirements. Okay. Okay. Miriam, you wanted to say something? Yes, my only so thing is I, I saw this, but I... I... I think I, I didn't know I could click on this to do the exercise. Yeah, it's clickable. Yeah, I, I just so once you click on it, it will just take you to the GitHub that breaks down the. So, for instance, let's look at here. I guess users to directory. Can you see my screen? No. Option and share. Let me just share the entire screen. So you seen it? So it takes you yes. to the Git yes, lab, and then you can, yeah, and you can see it's a whole lot. So you can take it one by one. So you come here. So launch this. If you don't have Chris G, you create your own. So there was a place, the first one that says create user asked us to create this. And so that's why it's now telling you to launch it. Under the create user, we have created that. So you can see um, add assignments. It's telling you how to add assignments. It's giving you the step by step. Remove a role assignment, download the CSV. So if you start from the beginning, all the way from here, where you create and assign users, you'll be able to get the first lab. So you can see that the first was to create this crazy game user. Are you seeing it now? I did that's it. Why you did that? Yes. Yes. Exactly. So by the time you are coming to this other step that is talking about rule assignments, you already have Chris Green as a user. Are you getting it? Yes. Uh -huh. So if you just follow the, the whole idea is, I want you to try it so that when we come, I'm not doing what you can do during the week. My own style of teacher, I just feel like, <laughs> for me, I didn't learn that way. I learned doing things on my own and then coming to say, oh, I had this issue. When you try it on your own, because that's the reality. When we come, I'd rather that you say, you know, and Titi, please try and have your laptop charged next class so that it would have just been easier to see what you're complaining of. And say, when I was trying to do this, I couldn't get past this. And then we do it together in the class. And then everybody can now learn. Versus I sit down and start telling everybody how to click office. These are things you can do on your own. And you probably did not need me to do it in this session. 
I think um, the issue I, I guess I'm having is the account to use in creating others. I don't know, is it the account I use in um, joining a, a textiler? Or no. I, I just use any no. random? No, when you set up your tenants, which account did you use to set up your tenants? So you're still, you are, that's why I'm saying what you're saying is confusing me. Didn't you get this thing when you did your tenant? Yes, yes, exactly. And that's the uh, one I'm using. So that's what you're supposed to use to create. So did you come to this place? Did you now go to, did you go to, this, go to subscription? Yes, ma. Exactly. When you come to subscription, let me paste this one. Sorry for cutting you. Eh? Initially, before I started the class, I had a, an account I started using on Microsoft Learn that I used in creating this. So that's the one I continue with. And I'm saying there's nothing wrong. Even if you had set up your demo platform before this class, it will still work. I'm saying it's the same thing. The moment you log into this, this is my account. So you can see now my subscription is remaining 30 days. Have we done 90 days? I've had okay. it since. Okay. It doesn't matter. I didn't set this up now. I set it up way. You can see I've used 121 days. I only have 30 days left. Okay. But I'm saying when you go to subscription, it will land you to log in with this administrator account. And even if you have forgotten what the password is, right? If you come and say forget password, it will take you here. The moment you put this code, It will send the recovery to the email account you used to set up the tenant. So once I do email, it sent a code to my personal email. That was my Gmail. And I put the code here and I will, it will now prompt me to change the password. And I will now change the password and I'll be able to log in. And once you log in, I don't need, I don't want to set up authentication now because I want to use it in the practice. I'll say, ask me later. And you're here now from here. So I'm sure this is where you're complaining of that you're seeing at me, right? Hello, Titi. No, 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 not here, ma. Not, I'm, I'm true with it. This uh, Microsoft 365, I'm not having issue with it. The, I'm using the, the, the exact place you it's you called portal dot azure i'm trying to just follow me titi understand how to do this thing it's not i don't feel you have a problem i just think it's you your mind is telling you i saw something in the class i must see that exact thing and i'm saying there are different ways to get there so you can see that i did not land on the place franca is using so i want to show you how to land there you come to add me okay man. ask me later i don't want to set up my authenticator And if I scroll down, Azure Active Directory. Mm. And I'm here. That's it. If I don't want to go through this way too, I just come to my browser and put hotel.azure.com. Ask me later. And I'm in the same place. Oh. Okay. So you're just locking your mind to what you saw in the class and no, don't don't learn like that. If not, it will affect you. It's the same thing. I'm here. The same thing here and here is the same thing. And I got here through admin. I got here doing it directly on the browser. It's the same thing. So these are my fictitious users. I can now create my own user doing the lab and X, Y, Z. Does it make sense now? 
Very well, ma. Very well. I'm actually getting the page like that. I got it that way. So from here, you start doing your demo. So you go back to this guidance and, and start all the way from here. Create user so that you do it. Please finish it up until day three. Because once we come here, we're now going into security. So we're going to look at multi-factor authentication, user authentication. I'm going to try and finish my own demo so that I'll have my own lab ready. And then we do this. We look at implementing conditional access. This is when it becomes, well. please, I need you guys to complete your lab so that when we come, we can now start creating conditional access policies. And it's going to overlap, overlap based on what we have done here. I'm not going to teach if I come and, and nobody else. If, if none of you have completed to day three, I will not teach. You, you will do the lab in the class. Do we have a deal? Yes. Demo. <laughs> All right, guys. So, we'll um, come to the okay, go ahead. Please. Sorry, sorry, before you go, um, how do I correct this that has only, you know, when we're looking at uh, my screen, it was only Teams that. Um, okay. Uh, yes. How do I correct that? You said I didn't select um, when I was installing it. I didn't. Okay. Once, I once didn't, we end, once we end the class, we can have a session and I explain to you. I can. You can share your screen. Okay. All right, thanks. Hello, Ma. Okay. Yes, please. Hello. Okay, yeah. Ma. Uh, I want to please kindly. I I have a little idea regards it, but I really want you to enlighten me more on how to document on a uh, GitHub when we are doing all these uh, labs, Ma. Mm -hmm. When you say document, to put your response or what? No. Uh, what I mean is, um, I, have to, I want to have a portfolio on uh, uh, identity and access management. So that um, after the, at the end of the, the, the class, I can have a, a, a reference to, if I put it on CV. So you want me to show you how to create a GitHub portfolio? No, I have a GitHub account already. I just want to, I'm not... Um, the way I did the past, I've done several lab in the past, and um, it was screenshotted. And I don't really. We always screenshot and explain each um, each step we took in uh, getting the the lab done. So I want to get more. Uh, the way my mind active, I'm not getting it right. I don't know. Please, maybe you can shed the a little light on how we can do it better. Documentation portfolio. Right? Okay, the way I know a portfolio is, is, is typical, simple. You just, like you said, if it's screenshot that you have, you don't have the actual, so you don't, like what this person has done, this is a portfolio. Whoever created, Microsoft created this lab for us. So this is a portfolio, right? And they put this for us to be able to do. So it's the same thing and you can see there as this. So if yours is screenshot, what you can do is you, you write created, so your exercise or your project can be, your project can now be to create a user. So you describe what your project is about. If you say to create a, sorry, I thought I would share my screen, sorry. I just realized I wasn't. Cool. Yes, I was going to say, we can't see your screen. <laughs> <laughs> so let's assume if this is your own portfolio, you, you can now, you maybe your portfolio, what you want to show, what you want people when they come to your portfolio to see is that you did a project on that involve X, Y. So you have to write what your project is about. So did you create um, did you create a user, or, um, create dynamic groups, assign user? So you could just put a summary of what that project was about and then break it down the tax. So your tax one would be creating user and then you now put the steps of what you did. Okay. In form of a writing or screenshotted a, a lab. It's the boat, it's the boat. Look at this person too. This lab that is telling you what to do. It did a mix of screenshot and word. Okay, ma. 
So in your own case, you want to show that you actually did it, right? So you can now put it here. So you you be, so as you are creating those users, you're taking screenshots. So probably okay. what you can do is when you have created the lab, so if the lab says, this lab says, create Chris Green, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, when you finish this lab, sorry. If I'm you, if I wanted to, if I'm the one that wants to showcase, I can do user management on my portfolio. What I would do is because this is a lab, right? I have done the lab. I will not put the lab on my own portfolio if it's me, because it's step by step. I want to show somebody that I know how to do this thing. So my own project will be, after I finish the lab, I will come and create my own project, which is what I'm going to give you guys. So I'm going to give you a project that is going to involve everything that you have done in the lab. So at the end of the class, we're going to have our project. Our project will involve you creating different users. So that project that we are going, I'm going to give you, you call it, you put it in your portfolio, whatever that project is. So in that project, I'm going to give a fictitious company or a fictitious scenario. So off my head, I'll just say things like, um, um, there's a, there's a um, manufacturing company that has a paint, um, a paint um, section and the manufacturing company has the, um, the um, production team, they have the um, distribution team, they have HR, they have IT. And I'll say, um, they have a staff strength of 10 users and I'll say, create, you know, users across each category. So I can say, create two users for IT, create three users for um, production, create five users for this, are you seeing? And then tax one should be, show creation of two users manually and show the creation of the remaining eight users using bulk method. Now, remember you have gone through your lab, right? So you, your portfolio are going to come here to put your project at that project name and your tax one will now be creating users, single users on Active Directory. And then you now put the step on how you created that user with your screenshot. And then your task group can now be creating users in bulk. And you now put the step of how you created the bulk user. When someone comes to your portfolio, they will see that you know what you are doing. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Mm. And that scenario can be an access review was done in XY organization and we identified XYZ users with XYZ rights, you know? And I can say the first thing to do is interpret that scenario. Take that scenario. So I could say that in that scenario, user Joy had um, global admin rights user Miriam had application administrator. After the access review, it was agreed that user Miriam should be restricted from application and a custom role should be created for her, create this scenario. So that's another project tax. So you put it, now what you are going to do is, first of all, create the scenario of that user. So you are showing that if it's a new organization that comes with a use case, you can create that use case. And then during, after the access review, you were able to identify. So I can say, um, based on what we have explained, maybe we explained that Miriam is supposed to be able to do only this, 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 but she has been assigned application administrator. Kindly identify the custom administrator role that will be suitable for Miriam. So it's not left for you to now, based on what you have understood for segregation of duties, least privilege, you will now decide, okay, Miriam should not have developer rights, should not have this. Maybe Franca would think otherwise and say she should have it. Uh, but when we all like, that's what you put on your portfolio. So somebody will see that you are able to do an access review, identify rights, understand how to use custom attributes to, sorry, custom rules to create segregation of duties. That's now the interpretation of the class. Lab is just for you to get familiar of where to click. The project is what tells us that you understood what you studied in the class. So your lab most times should not be what will be on your portfolio because the lab was telling you, click here, click here, click here. Anybody can do it. 
But your project is what tells you that you could interpret what you learned in your, and that's your pro, that's why it's your portfolio, what you have mm -hmm. done. For you that has CCTV experience, I could give you a scenario where I say, Titi had a client who wanted to set up CCTV. All right? During the yes. information gathering session, it was identified that security group should have access. IT should have access. MD should have access and no other person. It was also agreed that the CCTV admin portal should be integrated to an identity provider. In this instance, Azure Active Directory. Now say, based on this scenario, create a table showing your segregation of duties based on what you understand from each person's role which I'm sure you never used to do when you implemented CCTV. So what that means is, if in the security team, they said security people should have access, does it mean everybody in security? So it could be maybe CSO would have, so in segregation of duty, what you have understood, is that your table? I want to see you say CSO will have read and edit access. So CSO will have ability to view, delete footage, Security officers will have ability to view. MD will have ability to view. IT admin will have ability to view, see footage. And based on that segregation of duties, I will now say go and create the users on the identity provider and create the admin custom rules as applicable to your segregation of duty table. That's when I know that you have understood identity and access management. Because in the real world, that's what will happen. If you go and set up CCTV, you give everybody blank access to CCTV. Then a security guy, the day he connives with the fraud people, they come in, they rob, he goes in and he deletes footage and, and he leaves because you gave him, you did not give him this privilege. So in that your table, you will identify that security officers will have only view rights and each of them will have their accounts and will make it applicable on the identity provider. Then you put that, so your portfolio would be Remember, you have done, you have, you have created your GitHub that gives a background of who you are. 10 years experience setting up CCTV network across XYZ organization. And then you now right now, you know, tilting towards identity and access management, infusing identity and access management to improve on security controls for CCTV and network infrastructure. And then you now write your project. Your project is integrating Microsoft Active Directory to, um, and integrating that micro as a directory and applying segregation of duty and least privilege to a CCTV deployment. And then you put that scenario we put there, you put your responses and you now show how you did it. Then somebody will see your profile and say, this person knows what she's doing. You guys are quiet. Uh, I'm listening. <laughs> so, yeah. Titi, so, yeah. I need to see your face. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sure you're surprised. I'm sure you're surprised that, oh, I never thought of it like this. <laughs> so I always tell people, you don't have to junk your years of experience because you want to move to another sector of tech. I, I'm not a, I'm a strong advocate of, that's not true. It's, it's a long story. Huh? When you are not getting, you are just working and nothing to show for it. <laughs> it's because that's why you're in textiles and that's why we're here to help you. And it's the same thing across. I don't believe anybody who has not done tech before cannot do anything. I say, give me somebody who was a stay at home mom. I'll make her a security professional in six months. A mother huh. has intuition of security. Her children come back from school. She begins to ask them, what happened today in school? Did anybody touch you? Did anybody do this, right? That's, the, that's what a security person is doing. What happened? Who connected? Why am I seeing this login? What happened today? Who picked you? Who spoke to you like this? Who did that? 
She just needs to understand the terminologies in the corporate world. And she, she is the same skills. Okay, I'm sure if you're just joining us on YouTube and watching this, you're wondering what we're talking about. So we've ended the class and we're having our chit chat where we remind ourselves that beyond just learning in textiles, what we're doing is modeling professionals. Um, and so this is the security learning part. Please remember to watch day one, day two, and day three, so that you will be able to catch up with us on day four, where we begin to apply security policies in identity and asset management. Thank you again. My name remains Joy and Madam. See you next week. Thank you, Joy. We appreciate you. Mm -hmm.